Welcome to the Bumblecast. I am your host, Ian the Bumble King Flint, and joining me as always is my Bumble co-host, Kyle Krause. Hello! How are you doing, Kyle? Uh, well, I am getting over the flu, so right now I'm actually doing pretty good, so... You don't sound like you had the flu. I think you're lying. Uh, maybe I was. I don't know. <laughs> no. Curse you, amnesia flu! <laughs> No, no, I I was uh, I was pretty rough there for yeah about five days or so. Mm-hmm. It's a little touch and go, but uh, I'm better now, so that's good, right? Right? I think. Yeah. I can't. I can't tell. Can't really do the show without you. Are you sure? You can find someone else. Uh, nobody's got quite the same Kyle essence. Uh, is, is that what you want? <laughs> <laughs> It's kind of like materia, only more Krause. This is, I don't understand this. Well, it's not a anyway. very good analogy. Speaking <laughs> vaguely of materia, one of the recent additions to Super Smash Brothers was Cloud Strife. And since his, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, Controversial yeah, yeah. introduction. Uh, there were a few more additions to the groups. And uh, have you played the new additions to the roster, Kyle? I hate to say it, but I have not. Really? It's really, yeah, I've been, I'm way behind. I haven't even played Cloud, actually. And we talked about Cl- Cloud coming in on the show, like, months ago. Months yeah. ago, I don't know. It's been a while. This is just a matter of time or no interest. End of December. Uh, time. Time is an issue. Mm, well, I probably but, shouldn't be admitting to the free time I have, but I have sampled each of the new additions. I to want to. Cast. I want to. Well, let me give you my insight. Okay. And perhaps influence your future DLC purchasing decisions. I'm going to buy them all. <laughs> um, Humor me, Kyle. Okay, Humor yeah, me. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Maybe you'll help the listeners. We do have listeners to this show. We it's a weird listeners. it's a weird thing, but we do have listeners. And if anyone's still on the bench, maybe this will help sway them. All right, so let's start with old Spiky himself, Cloud. Uh first off, I was really tickled by the fact that he had both his game appearance and his movie appearance. Yes. Um, Movie version being Advent Children, where he got a big old co- coat and an odd door knocker on his shoulder. But <laughs> considering some of the designs that have come out since him, it's, it's not that weird, I guess. They, they are weirder. This is true. But, uh, you know, with the reveal trailer, I thought he was going to be Ike again. And it turns out he's a lot lighter than Ike. He's much more nimble. He's a lot faster. And he doesn't play nearly as similar to Ike as I expected. I thought he was basically going to be an Ike clone with a few little tweaks here and there. But uh, he doesn't hit quite as hard as I expected. The Buster Sword doesn't have quite the reach that I expected. And it feels like there's a couple of simple combos that you can pull off with him that are devastating. But to me, and I'm not speaking as a professional you know, Smash Brothers player, I would get annihilated by the people who do this for a living. But um, to me, he feels kind of light kind of weak overall Mm. and he's got his couple of gimmick hits and then he doesn't have a lot of game going for him otherwise i'm sure someone who knows him in and out by this point would be able to correct me but that's my initial feelings on him the uh, midgard stage that he comes with is really worth the purchase price to me the materia that you grab on the stage that causes the different summons to show up and cause different screen hazards to activate is more fun than cloud is in my mind (laughs) The stage looks beautiful. Oh, the stage is fantastic. The musical selection is anemic, oh, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah, well, this is Square we're talking about. Here. Yeah. They're very, so. I don't know, they're weird with music. Which is funny, because on the other end of the spectrum, Bayonetta, the second Sega rap, has, oh, what is it, six songs, I think, at least? Mm-hmm. It remixes of, or different versions of tracks. So it's like, hey, 
you want to hear some music? Have some music. Yeah. And her stage, the Fallen Clock Tower, which is one of the most jaw-dropping levels in video games, period. I don't, have you ever played Bayonetta? Oh, yeah. Not okay, completely, so, but I do know I am very familiar with the set pieces, yeah. Right. So you know how just amazing that stage is. It just throws you into the deep end, and you're going, Oh, what am I doing? This is amazing. <laughs> you're falling out of the sky on a exactly. piece of clock tower, and it's freaking cool. <laughs> and you know, a lot of the gimmicky stages that are constantly changing, I find distracting. Uh-huh. Like Final Destination, all that swoopity swirly stuff in the background really throws me off. Even though the stage itself is flat, I get really distracted by all that's going on in the background. And yet, Falling Clock Tower somehow feels better balanced visually, at least to me, because you have different platforms of different sizes coming in. You've got angels swooping in and out. You've got it flipping in and between dimensions. You've got that giant two-headed dragon monstrosity coming in on occasion. <laughs> And yet I still feel like I had a better handle on what was going on. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's because it feels like the stage itself is falling and thus everything clicks a little differently in my brain. I don't know. As for uh, Bayonetta herself, you know, she comes with both her original design and her Bayonetta 2 design. A color scheme that is based off of Jean, who is, what would you call her, her rival? Her yeah, kind of her, kind of her yeah, rival counterpart. That's Which is kind of how cool. to describe it, yeah. And, I don't know, her play style is very odd. I mean, well, it's still... <laughs> yeah, it's Bayonetta. <laughs> I mean, it, it falls into the same schema as any other Smash Brothers character, but to me, I felt like I could pick up Cloud and play him in a Smash Brothers mindset easier than I could pick up Bayonetta. Hmm. Even Ryu, I felt like I had a better handle on him Smash Brothers-wise than trying to play him Street Fighter style. Yeah. I mean, you can definitely use Bayonetta. I mean, it's not like she's got uh, too high of a bar of entry to figure her out. But I don't know. For me, she felt more technical. Like, I could feel like I was doing things wrong when I was trying to play with her, which, out of context, sounds really dirty, but that's Bayonetta, so I guess that's par for the course. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's pretty much how it goes. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know, she seems neat. I feel like if I could get a better handle on how to play the character, she would be absolutely devastating. It's just, she takes more thought and planning, I guess. Mm. Like, if you don't set up the combo right, you aren't really going to do a lot of damage, which really harkens back to her play style and, you know, Platinum Games' style of gameplay. Yeah. Anyway, so. Definitely. Kudos to them for that. She was definitely the one, the DLC character I was most interested in and excited about, like, overall. Like, of as they became announced, uh, I was like, yeah, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. All right, I'll pick up uh, whoever. Cloud eventually then then they said uh they were releasing bayonetta and i'm like yeah i'm in i'm down <laughs> I, i've uh i love her games so i'm really really interested in trying her out i, I gotta get onto that eventually soon and finally the most possibly controversial besides cloud <laughs> or even more than cloud is corin the avatar character for fire emblem fates which is just chock full of talking points in and of itself yeah. <laughs> but uh, something that kind of amuses me is everyone, you know, screaming about Fire Emblem having overrepresentation in the game. Which, to a degree, I can understand. There are other franchises that I wish maybe got a little more attention. But this has pretty much been the trend since Melee, you know? Yeah, yeah. Marth and Roy were in there to promote Fire Emblem. And Roy specifically for the newest game. They introduced Ike and Brawl to advertise the newest game. The fact that they have Robin and Lucina in is not that big of a surprise, given that Fire Emblem Awakening saved the franchise. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and then here is the next character to advertise the game. I mean, I guarantee you, if the timing works out and there's a Smash Brothers on the NX, whatever Fire Emblem game is coming out next is going to have a representative. Most likely. That is how it is done. Accept it. Embrace it. But uh, for Corin, he or she, since you get both the male and female model and voices, which I think is really cool. I'm glad they did it for Robin. Glad they did it for him and her. Uh -huh. For Corin, I should say, because otherwise <laughs> we're getting really confusing. I, I had heard rumblings of people saying Corin is broken. That's what I've heard, too. And I, I haven't kind of seen where they're getting that. Because Corin is really fast. Corin hits really hard. And a lot of Corin's attacks have ridiculous reach like that lance stabby arm move that he slash she does 
that goes for almost like half a stage in some areas. And it hits like a truck. Huh. And his, her, uh, charge attack that's kind of like Samus's charge beam uh-huh. not only charges pretty quickly, but it stuns at any charge level, stuns for a surprisingly long amount of time. And if you do manage to dodge the attack and get in close, it's followed up with a melee attack, a physical attack, I should say. So, uh, yeah, corn, corn kind of hurts people. Only, only slightly broken there, hey? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I figure once you know the character, once the metagame has gone on long enough and people yeah. learn the limitations and the movements and what you expect from a competent corn player, there will be ways to work around it. It just feels like straight out of the gate. They are maybe a little more on the kick your butt side. I don't know. Well, there's more. Um, there are more balance patches coming, right? I don't believe so. I believe they really? said that this was the last update. Huh. I thought they were doing maybe like one or two more, maybe just to kind of make sure that Bayonetta and Corrin were still okay. <laughs> that would make <laughs> now, sense, but eh. now the rumor I see floating around, and this is completely baseless, so take it with a shaker of salt. Right. But the rumor is that NX will come with basically Smash 4 Plus. The full roster, new balance patches, new features, possibly new characters, as a kind of launch title. I don't know if I buy that, but it wouldn't be the most obscene thing Nintendo's ever done. I heard it was going to be more like... uh... Maybe more like a Game of the Year edition with all the characters, the DLC characters included, all the new stages or returning stages, and basically more balance. Either more balance patches or all the balance patches included or whatever. I don't know. But again, it's just a rumor. So it could be anything. could be anything. Pie in the sky. At this point, I'm kind of starving for any real news news because they haven't said anything about the next Legend of Zelda. Star Fox has gone completely dark since the announcement of the delay, and we still don't know what the NX is, so... Nintendo <sighs> Nintendo is very, very secretive for some reason. It's weird. Do they normally they normally do this, though, don't they, where they just kind of go quiet for a while? Seems that way. And Seems then they like just the, hit you with everything. Yeah, the Wii... Like the, toward the end of the Wii's lifespan, I kind of remember things being kind of, okay, Nintendo, what are you doing next? <laughs> and it was a yeah. while before they, uh, before they announced anything. That's enough about cartoonish violence. Let's talk about more cartoonish violence. There was a movie you saw recently, along with me and just about every other human being on the planet. <laughs> Over the age of 17, unless accompanied by an adult, that is. And even right? still, some <laughs> adults know. didn't look at the ratings because I know. they're blind. Yeah. <laughs> but racking in hundreds of millions of dollars, putting to shame every single comic book movie to date, and being the most profitable R-rated film in the history of Western cinema, Deadpool. Aw, yeah. The two-hour-long apology for his cameo in the Wolverine film. Yeah, (laughs) that's pretty much what it is. (laughs) And apparently slight apology for making Ryan Reynolds uh, Green Lantern, (laughs) even though they had nothing to do with that. (laughs) So, you've seen the film. Correct, saw it this morning, actually. Did you like it? Uh, I loved it. It was excellent. 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 I do quite enjoy me some Deadpool. I mean, it was obscene. It was hyper violent. It was puerile. I would it not was have, perfect. I would not have expected anything less. <laughs> it was obviously made with love. It was one of those films where you could tell everyone involved just had a great time with it. You could tell and, Ryan Reynolds just ate up everything. He just oh, he, he <laughs> loves playing Deadpool. He loves Deadpool. It's freaking obvious. <laughs> There's an image that's been making the rounds where, oh, who was it? It was Ben Affleck asking if he could take home the bat suit after they finished filming Batman vs. Superman. Uh-huh. And they said they'd charge him, I forget how many hundred thousand dollars for it. <laughs> Ryan Reynolds said he just flat out stole one of the costumes and has it for himself. <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't you? <laughs> at, that, at that point, sure. Why not? Yeah, why not? And it really was an impressive costume because it was dead on to the comic book design as close as you can get realistically. It's yeah, it was actually it might be one of the more one of the closer comic book uh, costume in movies that I've seen. And do you know if the eye whites were like animatronic or if they were like 
somewhat grafted to his eye or something because they were so expressive. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how much of that was like CG or if it was uh, something else. I don't know for sure. I'm being told off mic that it was CG, so that okay. mystery is solved. Yeah, okay. That's kind of what I thought. <laughs> but yeah, there was, uh, there was a lot. I, there were a lot of practical things in that movie but the cg didn't look too bad no i thought the cg was rather nice especially considering that they lost 70 million dollars of their budget during production oh i did not know that yes they did which is part of the reason why it's such a straightforward film yeah it is a very straightforward <laughs> but at the same movie. time it doesn't need to be complex it's deadpool it's, i was gonna say it's an origin story it's a revenge flick ajax does him wrong he goes to kill ajax and everyone in the way suffers for Everyone it. Everyone in the way dies. And it's hilarious <laughs> along the way. Of course. I uh, I kind of knew that there was a connection with Deadpool and X-Men, but I didn't realize just how much of a connection there is, I guess. Is there a lot of a connection with Deadpool in the comics? i oh, unfortunately yeah. not well-versed in Deadpool comics. <laughs> not nearly as well-versed as I should be. Well, as yeah. someone who somewhat grew up with the character... I guess, Cable, sure I guess Cable would be the son of Jean Grey and Scott. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. All right, never mind. Yes. Well, one of the details <laughs> they kind of glossed around, or not glossed around, glossed over or danced around, is that Wade comes from a branch of the Weapon X program, the same program that created Wolverine. Wolverine, okay, yeah. So to that degree, it's directly tied in. Okay. Wade himself is not a mutant in the conventional right. sense, not like the rest of the X-Men. Right. It's just he has been altered to the point where he is a mutated individual. It's more like a science origin rather than a mutant origin. Right, right, Kind of right. like Spider-Man, I suppose. Yeah, kind of along those lines. And there are more intricacies and convolutedness to it, but when you get down to it, it's Wade Wilson who was brought into a bad situation and came out altered by the end. And he solves things with knifey time and shooty time. <laughs> by originally being a ripoff of Deathstroke. <laughs> <laughs> but who has become a much more popular and beloved character. <laughs> And he was kind of a reoccurring villain for a little bit. You know, somebody who could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Wolverine. Uh -huh. And they would just slash and shoot each other. Well, Wade would do the shooting, but there would be lots of slashing and dismemberment until one of them got tired or went their other way. And as Deadpool's popularity took off, he got his own ongoing for a little bit. And it eventually petered out. At the same time, or at least concurrently, Cable, another creation of Rob Leefield, became extremely popular. Kind of had his own book for a bit. That petered out. And then what was really gold was when uh, co-creator of Cable and Deadpool, Fabian, I can't say his last name, Nietzsche's? Nietzsche's? Nietzsche's, I think. Nietzsche's? I think, something like that, yeah. Anyway, really big fan of his stuff, even if I can't pronounce his name like an idiot, uh, <laughs> wrote Cable and Deadpool, where the two of them are thrown together and it becomes something of a buddy comedy. Mm -hmm. And hilariously, Cable gets dropped at the end of the series because a bigger name writer took him for the regular X book. So Cable Deadpool was mostly just Deadpool. And <laughs> that went for 50 issues. And if you can look it up, I suggest it. It's fun. Okay. Yeah, I really need to look into it this was back was this back in the 90s for cable and deadpool now cable and deadpool was early 2010s i think okay or late 2000s one of the two okay it's a, a fairly recent run and their bromance has become almost legendary <laughs> i don't did you ever get a chance to play the deadpool video game that was out recently i've been in the middle of playing it yeah I've, okay i haven't okay. gotten Have too you... far but i i i've gotten a couple chapters in well, once you get to Cable's introduction... Okay, I'm not there yet. <laughs> that that pretty much sums up their relationship right there. I was really happy with how they wrote their interactions in the game. Nice. Not sure if I was, was wild about Cable's voice, but eh, close enough. Yeah, the voice acting in that game, so far at least, hasn't been too bad. It's not bad, it's just I always imagine Cable with a deeper voice because his chest is broader than most people are tall. Yeah. And I imagine that much, you know, body cavity has a kind of deep, resonating voice. But uh, in the game, I thought it was pitched a little high, but mm -hmm. that, that's a nitpick. It's For those who haven't played the game, if you can find it used and cheap, I would recommend it. Or on Steam. It's on Steam right now, I think. Or on I Steam. I think it got back. I think it got put back on Steam. It was pulled off for a while. It's not brilliant by any stretch of the imagination, but yeah. 
it's funny for an action platformer. It's competent. Uh, the final bosses are kind of gimmicky and stupid. But beyond that, <laughs> if you're going in to play as Deadpool where you slash people up and blow people up willy-nilly, you get what you came for. Yeah, pretty much. And if you like your layer of snark over that, then you're in for a treat. I'd like to talk about it more, but I don't want to spoil you on it. Yeah, so yeah, just... and I don't, you don't spoil, you spoil <laughs> the listeners on it. Tell them you've you got to go play it. Same with the movie. you got to go see the movie if you haven't seen the movie yet. It really is just the perfect Deadpool movie. There's It doesn't try to be anything more than it is. It's Deadpool. It's not a superhero movie. It's not a franchise movie. It's Deadpool. No, it's not trying to fit into the X-Men mold. It's not trying to... Though it is in the X-Men universe. It is in the universe, yeah. We're not sure which one, but they poke fun at that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's the be- that's one of the better parts of the movie. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the thing that gets me about this movie, is that it would have so much pressure to conform to what people expect from the genre at this point. And to fit into a license that is you know, the only real superhero legacy that's holding up to what Marvel's doing. And it really feels like it was a film made by fans for themselves. Uh-huh. It, it feels like its own standalone thing. Yeah. And it shines for it. Yeah, superhero movies... To me, superhero movies now have sort of become not necessarily a genre. They're just kind of something that encompasses encompasses several different genres at this point. Because, like, Ant-Man was... Like a heist movie. You yeah. have your big team up movies with Avengers. You have sort of a kind of a fantasy ish thing going on with the Thor movies and just different things going on that really make them different genres. You have Guardians of the Galaxy, which is almost hard sci fi. Uh, I wouldn't go hard sci fi. Well, not super hard, but you know, it's, it's a little more, I guess, more Star Wars than anything still. More like science fantasy, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll go with science fantasy, what with, you know, Groot. Right. And the talking raccoon. I guess we just don't see that much sci-fi anymore, so you take what I can get. (laughs) You really don't. I saw a discussion earlier this week that was interesting saying, you know, why don't we see more sci-fi, like true sci-fi? And it's probably because it's a whole lot harder to do. Yeah. Now, with sci-fi in the realms of, like, Star Trek, and we'll say early Star Trek because it got kind of funky towards later incarnations, you know, you need an explanation. Even if it is a little bit of techno babble and it's kind of stretching some theoretical physics, it's supposed to be what might be, what potentially could be. Where science fantasy is, this is the force. I don't need to explain nothing. Metachlorians? Who needs metachlorians? I got the force. Forget that. Whatever. And I think, you know, the folks who want to kind of meld or morph, I should say, Star Wars into something more science fiction-y, you know, your midichlorians or you know, the cultural aspects of why a lightsaber makes sense or how the Force works or how all these races work. It's nice to get into the meat and potatoes of it, but I also think it kind of deviates from the spirit of it, which is why I liked the latest Star Wars movie, uh, because it felt like it wasn't trying too hard to be, here are the hard and fast rules of this universe. It was, there's the Force. This guy's a stormtrooper, but he doesn't want to be. So now he's not. Yeah. Uh, the Millennium Falcon, it got stolen, but they found it again. Yay! Just run with it. It chucks most of all of the explaining that the prequels tried to do just right out the window. Exactly. I mean, I wish some stuff had been better established here and there. You know, it starts off with, this old dude was really important to the Skywalkers. Why? Who? What? Why does he have the flash drive? That uh, Okay, he's dead now. Move on. I mean, some of that could have been a little better fleshed out. But overall, it's like Deadpool. It's fun. You just dive into it. You just accept what's there. And you get a good film out of it. Yeah, exactly. Well, I think we've exhausted the topic. Let's not strain you since you're still on the mend. Let's go straight to the questions, my good friend, and let you get back to resting. Let's do some questioning and answering. First up. From Uwai, what was the process of designing Quake Woman? Her designs, especially her head, is quite an oddball compared with both the main robot heroes and the boss robot master. Uh, Quake Woman's design, uh, it was decided that her design should contrast the character. Uh, she's you know comprised of bright colors. She's got the kind of happy peppy pigtail look going on which was supposed to immediately contrast with her very reserved, almost morose nature. So that when you see this character and you're expecting someone to, by the look alone, to be very happy and bubbly, and they are not, 
it's a red flag saying, okay, we know something's wrong here. What's her story? And it plays into exactly what we found out throughout the series. You know, she used to be a different person, so to speak, and had that taken away. And it became a story of how she started to find her way back to that. Huh. I guess that would make sense. I really love her design. It's adorable. <laughs> <laughs> Quantum Edge asks, do you have any definitive plans for Mighty and Ray? Uh, there are a few stories specifically I want to tell with them, but I wouldn't say I have a long-term end game for them. I'm treating them more or less the same way as I do the rest of the game cast, even though we have a bit more freedom with them. Well, yeah. that's something of a loaded statement. In some ways, we have more freedom with them. In some ways, we have less freedom with them. So it's not like I have a specific beginning, middle, and end with them. I know how they react to each other. I know what kind of adventures they would have. And I know some stories I'd like to tell with them. Let's put it that way. Okay, so they will be back. Yes, they will be back. Good. I'm, I'm glad because Mighty is cool. I've always liked Mighty, even though he's his design is kind of Sonic-y. <laughs> kind of. It is Sonic. <laughs> yeah, basically. It is, it's Sonic with a shell. Whatever. And what cracks me up, too, is I don't know if you saw, but a prototype never released game was discovered. Uh, Sonic the Hedgehog Brothers. Oh, yeah. Yep, yep. I which see, was see that. going to be a almost Dr. Mario-esque puzzle game, mm -hmm. except it sounded needlessly complicated, so that's why I got the plug pulled on it. But, you know, you look at this, you know, Red Sonic, Yellow Sonic, and then you look at Mighty and Ray, and it's like, huh, okay. Well, <laughs> now we know. <laughs> and it's like, hey, Sonic looks really good with a red companion, kind of a yellowy companion. What, what about uh, Tails and Knuckles? Yeah, sure, we'll just run with that. Sure, sure, sure. Sir all, we do now is a, all we need now is a superfluous blue character to go with Mighty and Ray, and the Trinity will be complete. <laughs> hey, hey, you work for the comics, you can make one up. Yeah, why not? Yeah, why not? That's what the that's what the comic needs. More characters, more. Of course. You keep making more, I mean, why not? <laughs> You, well, keep, that's one you, of the, you keep adding in all these egg bosses and new freedom fighter groups. I mean, sure, just throw another thing in there. <laughs> well, that's one of the things, uh, some of the feedback I've seen is folks are saying, well, you keep adding new stuff, but you're not doing anything with it. And these are the same folks who immediately after the reboot were saying, there's not enough stuff in the comic. We lost all this world building. You need to do world building so we can have all these characters again. It's like, all right, well, Here we're we going go. to use the Shattered World arc to explore the world and add this, you know, big cast of characters that we could explore. Well, now there's too many characters. You should focus on these instead. It's like, okay. Ian, it's the Sonic fandom. They're never I happy. Know. They're I never know. happy. You have not enough characters. You make Sonic only playable. People are like, where's Tails? Where's Knuckles? I want to play as them. You make everyone else playable along with Sonic. Everybody gets angry. There's too many characters. What's this fishing minigame doing in here? I don't want this. It's like, well, make up your minds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Anyway. Yes. Next, Sarugi wants to know. Which writers would you consider influential in your work? Oh, goodness. There and, is a... And comics and manga apparently do count, which, I mean, why would oh, they? Oh, sure. But... Um, I know I'm going to be forgetting people, but... Off the top of my head, in straight literature, we can say Stephen King. And I'm going to be a snob and say earlier Stephen King. That's fine. <laughs> um... We could go on a whole show about what I didn't like about the last few Dark Tower books versus the first few Dark Tower books, but <laughs> maybe we'll say that for another time. Um, I just think he has a very good way of conveying character and building tension. Mm -hmm. uh, Orson Scott Card, primarily for the Ender Saga and the Alvin Maker Saga, and the book Treason, which is a very, very hard book to read. Um, I don't know if you have read any of his stuff? Uh, nope, I'm not familiar with any of it, really. Uh, stick to just his fiction. Don't read his personal views. It'll That's really what I've, sour. Mm. That is what I've heard. I've heard some things about Orson Scott Card that are... Yeah, yeah. Just, just stick to the books. Don't, yeah. don't pay attention to him. <clears throat> but uh, <laughs> Treason is one of his earlier books, and I think it has a lot of effect on how I approach big ensemble casts. 
and you know just building a world and its crazy mythology it's a really hard book to read because things are bad for the main character and they get worse for the rest of the book mm-hmm. until the ending and then you're like okay i guess it was worth all that maybe <laughs> it, it it's a good read it's an interesting read but it's rough mm-hmm. um george r r martin because what that man has constructed with his Game of Thrones stuff is terrifying. Um, Aaliyah is a big fan of it too, and she's been going through a lot of the nuances and fan theories and stuff. And it isn't like simple stuff like, oh, I think this character is going to survive, or I think this character is really this character in disguise. There are intricacies upon intricacies that go back through all the books, go into some of the side books, Stuff And it's not convoluted. That's the thing that drives me crazy. It isn't complex for the sake of being complex. It feels organic. It feels like this is this sprawling nation with multiple peoples and multiple cultures, and all of this ties together in a very logical fantasy way. And how he is able to do that and have not screwed up by now? <laughs> I, I don't... I can't do that. <laughs> That's impressive. It's... Oh, it's phenomenal. Um... In terms of manga, there's uh, Hiromu Arakawa, who did Fullmetal Alchemist. And again, another one of those stories where everything just fits together brilliantly by the end. And it's really intimidating. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, you have Akira Toriyama, who I'm not going to call Dragon Ball brilliant by any stretch of the imagination, but it's fun. You can't help but get invested in it. There's something simple and satisfying about the power level creep more or less <laughs> and you know these nuggets of characterization that are fun to play off each other that has obviously been wildly successful so whatever it is at its core that has made the dragon ball series so endearing he's got to be doing something right yeah uh comic books jeff smith for the bone series um michael j straczynski for the way he's revamped so many stories and Ed Brubaker along that same line. Um, I know this is going to rankle some people, but I've enjoyed a lot of Brian Michael Bendis' stuff, mostly on his early work on Powers. Mm. Yes, he likes lots of dialogue. We, I know, I know. <laughs> but uh, a lot of his early stuff, it, it felt very pulpy, but still very comic booky. I guess. Mm. Uh, really enjoyed... Robert Kirkman's earlier stuff on Invincible. Don Rosa's work on The Life and Times of Scrooge McDuck is just fantastic. That yeah, that's those are definitely some good comics. <laughs> I feel like I should just like pull every book off my shelf and start reading out author names, but <laughs> that, that's a smattering of folks that I can immediately think of. I know there's some I'm missing, but they're still excellent, excellent writers. Awesome. All right. We've got another one here from Next Walt Disney. He keeps coming up. Well, having been frozen and resurrected so many times. I know, I know. It's weird. He asks, if you could rewrite the entire plot of Sonic Heroes, would you have Neo Metal Sonic be the boss instead of his transformation? Oh, hmm. I think at its core, there's nothing really wrong with Sonic Heroes' story. It could stand to be a little fleshed out in certain segments. Yeah, I was but gonna say it's a little basic for the most part. I mean when you look at how things fit together, like I'm willing to bet that in the script for the CG scenes, when Amy's looking at the newspaper and it shows Sonic running off with Froggy and Chocola, which probably should be pronounced Chocola, but let's not even get into that. It probably said it was supposed to be a blue Sonic like blur, but you can't really do that with those early CG renders. Yeah. So, and why is Sonic kidnaps a frog from Pages News anyway? But let's not get into that. <laughs> Point is, Metal Sonic, with what I'm going to be calling just an advanced version of the chameleon chip, is strategically getting the biodata off of everyone he needs to become perfect cell, really, when you get down to it. Yeah. That's a neat angle. And I like to think that part of it comes from, you know, Eggman upgrades the chip. And the first thing Metal Sonic does is copy his bio data, which gives him the evil Machiavellian angle to throw him in a closet and say, ha ha, I'm Eggman now. See, all of that could really fit together in a neat way. And especially how the whole warehouse full of shadow androids plays into Shadow the Hedgehog. There's a nice continuity there. 
So what's there could stand to be embellished a little bit, but I think the story itself is fine for what it is. It doesn't need to be anything deeper than that. As for Neo Metal Sonic, I didn't really mind the big star shape head design. A little weird, but it still looked like, you know, an advanced Metal Sonic. Really wasn't fond of the Metal Overlord dragon look. Yeah, that was weird. I mean, to me, Heroes feels like Chaotix 2.0. You have a large cast of characters who are all tethered together with their unique abilities allowing you to traverse the stage. You run through special stages that are big tubes and ultimately you fight a giant version of Metal Sonic. Never mind the Chaotix actually show up in Sonic Heroes. Yeah, no, it's very much Chaotix. Like, it's kind of weird. So, to me, if Metal Overlord had been something more akin to Metal Sonic Kai, I would have liked it better. I think the dragon just went too far off course. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, having Metal Sonic make that big push and become, you know, big monster form, I don't have a lot of problems with. It's just, he didn't, he wasn't Metal Sonic by the end. He was Scrap Metal Dragon Monster. Something else, yeah. Yeah. Metal Overlord's music is cool, though. Oh, sure. (laughs) I'm all over the Crush 40 butt rock anthem final level music. But, well, yeah, of course. And, you know, the parts of the boss fight, it was a mess of a boss fight anyway, but parts of yeah. it were cool. You know, he's whipping out Chaos Control, he's swooping down and grabbing pieces of the Egg Fleet to throw at you. Not Sorry, not pieces, entire ships. Yeah. He's throwing <laughs> chips at you. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's a wasted opportunity that Tails and Knuckles get super shields. They don't get their super forms yeah, back. Yeah, yeah, that was... That sucks. But, you know, there are interesting ideas, there are elements I like, but I think it missed the mark on a few places. Mm, yeah. The game the game's a little bit buggier than I remember. Maybe it just hasn't aged as well. As oh, I... Mm. I don't know. It, to me, it's like trying to steer a stick of butter on greased glass. Yeah, it's the controls are... Nigh upon long. unplayable. And it's funny, because when it came out, I remember liking it a lot. It'd be like, yeah, a whole game full of speed levels, which were the best part of Sonic Adventure 1 and 2. I'm down, but... <laughs> playing it again, it's like, eh, weird. But then again, I went back and played Sonic Adventure 2, and I'm like, eh, this is weird. It's not aged as well as I'd hope, and I'm I'm probably calling down the hate machine. <laughs> I should probably be careful. Here's what kills me. I mean, Sonic Heroes has a really interesting soundtrack. Yeah, it's, it's good. It has some fascinating details in the textures and in the level design. Yeah. I mean, I love the fact that with Hang Castle, or... Cryptic Castle, whichever version of the stage you want to refer to. On the one side, you have this giant Eggman built into the castle, and on the reverse side, it's Neo Metal Sonic. Huh. I need to play it again, then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, at least that part, maybe. Oh, yeah. Um, and it gives you the kindness of, like, you can play all four stories and get the Chaos Emeralds across them instead of having to play each individual one and get it four times over. Yeah, yeah. But the only really viable, or at least not hair-pulling ver- way to do it is to go through Team Rose, since their stages are cut in half. Yeah, Team Rose was And are easier way, anyway. Yeah. Because the whole nonsense of find the key, get the key, do not get hit until the end of the stage to keep the key, then defeat the special stage. Just, ooh. If you hadn't, you know, kind of gently served to me with Team Rose, I would have never finished it. Yeah, it's frustrating. It's a very frustrating game, the way it makes you play to get the... To unlock the proper final boss. But it gave us back the Chaotix, so... Yeah. It's a mixed bag. Yeah, Sans Mighty, though, who's been completely missing. Whatever. <laughs> All right, some more questions here. Got one from Fancy Fool. They want to know, if you were allowed to keep or create parents for the game cast, would you do it, or would you just keep the game cast parentless? I would keep them parentless. Okay. Um, I think one of the core aspects of... Sonic as a character by narrative and by design is that he's free to do whatever he wants whenever he wants. Right. When you start introducing a family, then it becomes a question of, well, if they're in trouble, why isn't he looking after them? Do they worry about him? Is there a place that he can call home? Is there a reason he doesn't stay there? You can argue that, you know, he's got a free spirit and maybe his entire family is nothing but free spirits and they're all constantly wandering. That'd be kind of fun, but it adds aspects and questions and baggage that doesn't necessarily need to be there. Yeah. Tails. All right. Let's just spitball here. Sonic, maybe if his family is conducive to the free spirit that he is. And if we're going to go speculative here, I'd probably base it off that ancient manga that introduced Amy and Charmy way back in the day. 
Tails, absolutely not. The whole point is he was an orphan and on his own, and Sonic taught him to be strong and independent. Knuckles, no, he's the last of his kind. That's his defining feature. <laughs> it bugs the crap out of me because, you know, who came before him? You know, did he just appear next to the Master? Well, I'd like to answer to that, but no, he shouldn't have family. Amy Rose, maybe? But then it begs the question of what was she doing wandering off on her own to Little Planet, you know, all those years ago? And so on and so forth. So I think vanilla is all we really need because she explains where Cream goes when she's not adventuring. Mm. But at the same time, begs the question of why does she let Cream go adventuring? She's six years old. What is she doing traveling to different dimensions with the fire-throwing cat and all this nonsense? So, I don't know. Leave it as it is. Let the adolescent and pre-adolescent colorful animal people jump on robots without any familial baggage. Would you explain their absence at all or anything? I mean, sometimes it wouldn't be really necessary for some characters, I suppose, but... No, but I mean, if it's... Let's take Cream's example, since she's the only really canon example to go off of. Say that Vanilla trusts... Sonic and Amy to look after her. There you go. Well, that makes sense. She she sees what Tails has become under Sonic's tutelage, figures Cream could have a good learning experience. That, there you go. But you don't need to do that every single time because then it gets (laughs) repetitive. It gets, it bogs it down. It doesn't need the explanation. It doesn't need to be there. Yeah. So you would explain like why you would explain why she wouldn't have a father or anything. Right, right, right. So, I mean, Other characters, other franchises, other stuff, it might make more sense. But with Sonic, it's one of the things I don't miss now that we've revamped everything. Yeah, it's not really necessary. I mean, with the old stuff, I was working towards wrapping it up and closing it off, which I will be covering in Lost Hedgehog Tales. I promise it is coming. Just other stuff. But I'm glad that I don't have to deal with it anymore. I think you could incorporate certain characters' parents. I mean, you already have that precedent with uh, King Acorn. Right, but, uh, so, with but not a game, cast. not a game character, but this the extended cast, right? That's Well, that's the thing with the extended cast is they you have kind of do more whatever freedom. You want, yeah. Exactly. You can do more with them. Yeah. They exist to create the illusion of progression in the narrative. Right. Whereas the main cast who must stay true to their core because it's a licensed property, don't change. So the things change around them, they interact with those changes, it feels like we're moving forward when we're really not, and we've been through this hundred times. <laughs> yes, we've talked about this before. All right, should we get to the last question? The last question. The last question ever. No, just kidding. <laughs> we're still doing this. Uh, Philip Doctor wants to know, before you started writing for the Sonic the Hedgehog comics back in 2006, has it been that long? Man, time. Mm. Ten years. Wow. Ten years. Were you a big fan of the video games that had to do with them? Yes. yes I'm not I was. so sure. <laughs> I'm not convinced. Oh, you're going to test me, is that it? Yeah, I'm not convinced. Not counting the Atari, the Genesis was my first real console, Kyle. I still don't believe you. I bought a Nomad on purpose, Kyle. I, I wanted a Nomad on purpose, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> You didn't buy it, though, which was probably the smart option. I did. Actually, no. Well, I was I also a child and didn't have any money. I went with... with I, <laughs> that was a lot of lunch money that I saved up. There were some meager weeks for the old Bumble King back in the day. <laughs> I was going to say, those things were like 200 bucks, which was actually think, fairly cheap at the time. Eh, for a handheld for a system, handheld. system, I guess. Well, what did... I mean, it was a handheld Genesis when you get down to it. Right. Yeah, that's and then exactly I think the rechargeable battery pack was another 50 stinking dollars. Mm-hmm. But it may have been not the most brilliant purchase of my lifetime, but it did allow my youngest brother to play original Genesis cartridges and experience what I experienced. And then he went and deleted my 100% run in Sonic and Knuckles. and st- Oh. Huh. Mm. Those are... I think the Nomad actually goes for a pretty decent chunk of change now in the collector's market, so maybe it was a smarter uh, investment than you than you thought. Really? I might have to look into that. Yeah. there A lot of that older stuff is getting a little bit more expensive, especially the Sega Nomad was kind of a limited run, a little rare, so not super rare, but there's not too many of them out there. I always wanted to get it, a second controller, and the proper connection cables, and plug it into a TV. That was the whole point of the system, because you couldn't really play it in the car. It would die within an hour. It works just like a Sega Genesis. Exactly. Use it as a Genesis on the go. You go to the beach, you go to the mountains, whatever, plug it into the TV, boom, you got a Genesis right there. 
Yeah. Some people have done some really nice screen mods and battery mods, too, to use new fancier batteries and new fancier screens. They look really mm. good. They look really sharp. It's a bit of, bit of work and a little bit expensive to go that route. If you really want to play a game with your Nomad, that might be the way to go. And you don't care about keeping it original. But some people care about keeping it original. Sure, sure, sure. So my, uh, my Game Gear, actually, all the capacitors are dead on it, so it doesn't even work. That's too bad. I'm sad. But back to the original question. Yes! I have always been a big fan of the Little Blue Hedgehog. Good, because it would be weird if you weren't. <laughs> it would have been an interesting past ten years. <laughs> uh, you, okay, would, you, the... would have, you would have become a fan rather quickly. <laughs> you would have to have had become a fan rather quickly, or not, I don't know. I don't know, it's kind of odd looking back. You know, ten years of it, and you know who I was as a person getting onto the book, you know, a fan getting to write the book, yeah. and all the things that have happened in between now and then to the franchise and to the book and to me personally. And you know, sometimes I actually stop and say, "Do I really want to keep doing this? Am I done? Is it time to move on?" And there's a part of me that goes, professionally, yeah, it's probably better to pick up and move on. And there's another part of me going, "Nah, I'm good." I'm I'm good. It's my childhood favorite. I still enjoy writing it after 10 years. I'm still coming up with stories. I can still do other things, of course. Right. I do want to branch out and tell different stories in different ways, but I could quite contently write this for the rest of my life. <laughs> You've really built it up and made it your own, so I have to... Double tapsies, no I have to commend you for that. Yep. <laughs> It's definitely yours at this point, almost. I, if it weren't for the fact that it were a licensed book. that That's the thing that's, that's the caveat. Yeah. You know, to me, and not to delve too deeply into it, because emotions run high on this aspect, but as much as the past ten years have been my run, Sonic is not mine. Right. You know, this may be my take on it. This will definitely have been my era on the book, but it's not mine. There are a lot of original ideas I poured into this, a lot of original characters I did, and a lot I contributed to. It's still not mine. It's still Sonic. And it's still a privilege and an honor to be part of it. You know, who else gets to grow up loving something and then being a very large part of at least one facet of it? Yeah. That's awesome. That is awesome. But I'm never going to say, you know, oh yes, this is my book. This is my vision. It, it's my contribution. Mm -hmm. to a greater th greater whole. Well, there are a lot of aspects that are yours. I mean, I guess technically they're Archie's, but still, <laughs> you, they're your creations, like your characters. Yeah, like, but you know, designs, in the end... Stuff like that. I know, the, in the end, it's all Sonic. If somebody, you know, picks up a trade or something 10, 20, 30 years down the road, provided the world hasn't ended and we're all ruled by cockroach people, you know, if civilization still stands and somebody picks up this and goes, oh yeah, that Flynn guy wasn't half bad. That's cool. That is my legacy on the book. That's a successful a successful run. And speaking of successful runs, I think we're just about at the end of the show, right? Yes, before you start getting sick again. Oh, don't worry. I'm already sick of everything. <laughs> ah, make it stop. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Flips the tea table. <laughs> yes. All right. You want to take us out, Ian? All righty. So this has been episode 11 of the Bumblecast. If you want to follow my Sonic adventures or anything related to me, head on over to www.bumbleking.com or on Twitter at, uh, at Ian Flynn BKC. And if you want to know what I'm up to, head on over to KNGI.org, where I've got some cool stuff coming up very soon. Uh, actually, next month is the uh, KNGI anniversary. Woo! Always do something cool for March. So I have something. I have some ideas. I have some ideas. I can't reveal anything, so but I will oh, in due dude. time. So KNGI.org. If you're looking for pod, more podcasts to listen to, uh, video game music or discussion, or even this show. This show's over there, too. So head on over there. And you can also find me at KyleJCRB on Twitter. And I think that's it, unless you had anything else you wanted to throw in, Ian. I got nothing. Have a good night, everybody. See you later. Thank you for listening to the Bumblecast. Please subscribe to the show and leave a rating and review on iTunes. Find more episodes at BumbleKing.com and KNGI.org. BumbleCast is copyright BumbleKing Comics. Original music composed by Ken Coda Snyder, used with permission. Find more music from Coda at bc.s3m.us. Pay what you want for the intro theme. 
as part of the compilation album Noise Chan and Nugget Adventures in Chiptune at noisechanradio.bandcamp.com. <laughs> 